Hello, my name is Nathan Toronto, and on behalf of the Carnegie Middle East Center and the Program on Civil Military Relations in Arab States, I welcome you to this live panel, Arming for Pandemic, Military Responses to COVID-19 in the Arab World. The world is still transfixed as the COVID-19 pandemic has spread from country to country, straining health systems and supply chains, and causing leaders and publics alike to ask what the future holds. Nowhere are these questions more relevant than in the Arab world, where uh, wars in at least three countries have raged for years, where uh, a drop in oil prices has strained national budgets and undermined remittances across the region, and where tourism is at an all-time low. Arab states have used military forces in different ways to confront the pandemic, from uh, providing logistical and other resource support to actively enforcing quarantine or uh, social distancing measures, and even in some cases, to uh, enforcing state authority in new ways. What impact do these decisions have on governance, on the social bargain, and on the relationship between the military and society in these countries? Given the pandemic, what is the future of Arab civil military relations? We have four panelists with us to discuss these questions. Uh, Frederick Wary is a senior fellow with the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment of International Peace. Robert Springborg is a retired professor of national security affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School and a research fellow at the Italian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, Fred will discuss the situation in Tunisia. Bob will discuss the situation in Egypt. Emma Soublier is a, a visiting scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington and an associate researcher at Centre Michel de l'Hôpital, Université clermont auvergne And she will discuss the situation in the Gulf. Aram Nergizian is a senior advisor of the Program on Civil Military Relations in Arab States at the Carnegie Middle East Center. And he will discuss the situation in Lebanon. Each panelist will take five minutes for uh, approximately five minutes for an opening statement, uh, after which we will move to questions from you, our virtual audience. So I encourage you to put your questions in the comment section of the YouTube page where this panel is being streamed. So without further ado, we will uh, turn it over to Fred. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to join you from uh, Washington, D.C. And for added effect, uh, you might hear some military helicopters um, overhead. So I'll talk about Tunisia. It's been one of the bright spots of the Arab world in its response to the COVID uh, pandemic. And the military has been an important part of that response. Um, the military has worked with the Ministry of Interior Forces in the enforcement of government-directed quarantine and social distancing. Um, they've provided economic relief, delivering food and medical supplies to interior regions. Um, they've set up military field hospitals. And by and large, this role has been generally accepted and welcomed by the Tunisian military's leadership and rank and file. Um, by law, the disaster relief is one of the armed forces um, missions. And, and there's no real evidence of the military overstepping its mandate trying to claim privileges in terms of receiving protective equipment. There's been some retired officers that have called for government appointments, claiming that they know how to handle um, crises. But the Tunisian military is a bright spot. It doesn't have the um, profit generating enterprises like other Arab militaries. Um, that said, there are some challenges looming over the horizon that we need to be attuned to. Uh, and that's related to the economic fallout of this pandemic. I mean, Tunisia has ridden out the initial wave of infections relatively well, but the economic devastation in terms of unemployment um, and other um, effects is, is quite drastic and long-term. As I argued in a recent War on the Rocks article, um, the economic fallout could impact the Tunisian military in, in a number of ways. First, in readiness and its ability to execute other missions and second, on the military's relations with elected civilian authorities over impending budget austerity measures. Um, so first, on the readiness and force development issue, this mobilization of the military um, in, in the, during the pandemic has not put undue strain on the armed forces' abilities to carry out other missions. And there are a number of other missions ongoing 
namely counterterrorism in the Western region near the Algerian border and also control of the border with Libya. The latter is especially important given the worsening civil war there where you've got uh, drones and fighter aircraft. But there are limits to how long this tempo can be sustained. Um, in addition, the, mili the Tunisian military has always been leery about domestic policing, infrastructure protection, crowd control. They took over some of these roles from the Ministry of Interior after the revolution, uh, but they were always eager to hand that back over. They're, they're very sensitive to their um, image in the public's view, which is quite positive. Again, the military enjoys widespread public support because of its role in the 2011 um, revolution. Now, if we see widespread economic devastation and protests in the interior region, the military could be called on to augment um, the National Guard and Ministry of Interior forces. That could have a negative impact on its mission, mission areas and other, um, and other areas. The other economic knock-on effect concerns conscription and the type of military, the Tunisian military is trying to become. There's a, there's a danger that I think if the economic devastation sweeps through the interior region with massive unemployment, you could have political pressure on the Tunisian military to absorb these unemployed, unskilled young men. And that could have drastic implications over the long term for the force, that it, for the military that's trying to transform itself into a leaner, more technologically savvy uh, military. The second risk relates to the impending um, budget cuts. I mean, the, the Tunisian government's gonna have to be forced to make choices given the, the economic austerity, given the, the budget strains that are looming, the belt tightening could affect the military in terms of procurement, in terms of personnel salaries, and that could strain relations with the parliamentary committees that are charged with oversight of military affairs and the Tunisian military's budget. There's already um, rocky relations between these committees, the parliamentary committees and the Tunisian military. Now, I'm not saying that this could upend democracy or the social contract, but it could um, strain things. And, and you know, there's always a risk for non-transparency, corruption and procurement, possibly the, even the military's move into commercial enterprises. Again, these are not locked in stone. I would rather be accused of um, uh, you know, being too pessimistic than neglecting these, these warning signs. What's this mean for, for Tunisia's Western partners? Um, we should be mindful of these potential bumps over the long term. The US, uh, especially the US effort, has been focused on train and equip, on counterterrorism missions, on border surveillance, on intelligence fusion. And these are all worthwhile areas, but we need to focus on equipping the Tunisian military with these broader institutional challenges of budget planning. Again, if you're forced to cut your budget, does the Tunisian military understand how to go about doing risk calculation? You know, I don't, I don't need this equipment. I can't buy this. There's, a, there's an entire science to that that by many accounts, the Tunisian military doesn't do very well. And I think that's an area where Western partners can help. And likewise, in managing military parliamentary relations, that's going to be a crucial area over the, over the future. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. Bob, take it away. Thank you, Nathan. Pleasure to be here. Unlike Fred, uh, who sort of drilled down into the military itself, uh, <clears throat> and rightly so in the case of Tunisia, <clears throat> where the military and the state uh, are indeed separate, in Egypt, uh, they have been the difference between the two has been elated. It's uh, become a military dictatorship. And so the investigation of the impact of COVID-19 on the military is necessarily then an investigation of the impact on the state itself. And going further than that, it's a dictatorship in the sense that it is a one-man dictatorship, uh, all of the classic ones of Hitler, Stalin, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and so the, the literature, just to digress into the academics the material for a moment, the literature relevant then to the collapse of dictatorships, uh, it seems to me, is uh, of relevance here in Egypt. And what the, the principal finding is of that literature is that 80% uh, or so uh, 
of such dictatorships collapse as a result of uh, internal issues that is within the state itself and within the core of the state, principally the military and security services, uh, about 20% fall as a result of widespread rioting and so on. The other finding relevant to the future of dictatorships uh, is the so-called pacting literature about reformers inside and outside the state coming together and forming a coalition to overthrow the, uh, the dictator. Uh, now, one Lynch, who's the sort of godfather, if you will, of that literature, noted that in sultanistic regimes, it's very unlikely to get those sorts of pact between reformers inside and outside. So all of this is to say that uh, CC is in a very high wire act in this country uh, and that uh, the military is critical from the point of view of his control of it to the future of the country, more critical, it seems to me, than outside events. Now, what has been the impact then of uh, uh, the uh, pandemic in a particular effects? Well, economically, as Fred noted in Tunisia, uh, not favorable, it's uh, infinitely worse uh, in Egypt, uh, where there were already serious problems. Uh, the uh, downturn of the big four of the Egyptian economy, so as canal, uh, hydrocarbon exports, uh, remittances and tourism, the classic four pillars of that uh, economy for the past 40 years uh, are in each case absolutely profound. So the economy itself uh, is suffering difficulties. Egypt is heavily indebted, about 100% of GDP now for uh, combined foreign and domestic debt. Access to public capital is getting much tighter uh, around the world and access to private capital uh, is of course very difficult. The purchasing manager index in Egypt has never been as low as it, as it is and that's the best indicator of economic activity. So there are lots of problems. So the economy is one pillar of regimes. The second pillar of course is, is fear. Uh, dictators rule uh, not only by uh, trying to promise their citizens better lives but also by inducing fear CC has been clearly well at work on that uh, in response to COVID-19, uh, the various arrests, the clampdowns and so on of anyone criticizing uh, the regime's handling of COVID-19 have been well covered internationally. The third pillar uh, of dictatorships uh, is the promise of, of performance. Uh, so the trains running on time were Mussolini's promise uh, and CC has long identified himself and his regime with the idea that it could do the job better than the old civilian administrators uh, in charge of the civilian bureaucracy. COVID-19 has shaken that. Uh, it's clear that the handling has been poor. Uh, in the last two or three days, the rate of infect new infect in in infections has dropped, but it's still very high, excess of 2,000 a day. And so on. So the claim to legitimacy through performance uh, is, is also now, it seems, in question. Uh, and then this brings us finally to the inner core, the 80% chance uh, of the military and or security services causing problems. Uh, so what is the impact then on the military of COVID-19? Uh, first, on procurement. Uh, Egypt in the last several years has become one of the top five purchasers of arms internationally in what is a highly constrained uh, economic circumstance, thereby suggesting that the financing of, of uh, these arms purchases is primarily, primarily external, which it has been, uh, but those external sources are not going to be as generous by any means as they have been. So toys for the boys, uh, the so-called Jane's effect of uh, the on paper military uh, uh, excellence uh, is itself going to be attacked. And what's important about this is not only that it will no longer burnish the image uh, of the Egyptian military to have the most uh, up-to-date armaments and continual procurement of them, but sustainment in the form of training uh, and maintenance is also going to suffer. And the training is particularly important uh, as it involves then uh, the opportunity for officers and others uh, to experience uh, their pleasant times in France or the United States or wherever it might be involved in that training. So it's one of the perks the military uh, is going to be increasingly denied as a result of it. Uh, the military economy uh, is also going to take a huge hit already. The new administrative capital this choose your figure 40 to 300 billion expenditure, which is being run by the uh, supervised and much of the contract work done by the military. 
uh, that uh, is, is uh, already been pushed back its opening date. Uh, and other mega projects are the same and the military is involved in virtually every single one of them. So the opportunities for patronage through those appointments is going to be reduced. Um, and then there's the, act, the impact on performance. Uh, Egypt uh, has the largest military in the Arab world far and away and uh, not necessarily the most expensive one, uh, but the one that has the most illustrious history. The impact on performance uh, is uh, presumably going to be increasingly negative. It's in the case of controlling its own territory in the Sinai, of, con of influencing events, whether to the west in Libya, whether to the south in Sudan, or whether to the east in Gaza, has stagnated. Uh, the insurrection uh, in the Sinai goes on. Uh, General Hiftar, who's been uh, supported by uh, Sisi, uh, is clearly in trouble. Uh, the Sudanese regime has uh, pushed, positioned itself between Ethiopia and Egypt over the GERD negotiations, uh, and Gaza continues to be run uh, by Hamas. So uh, Egypt's capacity to project its power uh, immediately in its own country or on its borders has been increasingly limited as time has gone on as far as projecting that power further afield, whether into Syria, Lebanon, uh, or elsewhere with Yemen for example, uh, is, uh, has also been vitiated. So uh, the military has uh, a few claims to success uh, and at the same time is going to be undergoing greater pressure. So to circle back around now to our 80% chance, uh, what do we see? Uh, CC uh, is a man who reflects the typical problem of dictators of ambitions far exceeding resources. Uh, and the megalomania uh, is his own worst enemy. As he becomes increasingly dependent on the coercive base necessary to, to subdue a population, which is being rewarded ever less by his regime, uh, then it's going to be uh, uh, just like Mubarak found, a military that uh, will have reason to, uh, to stop support of him, uh, that he is uh, too much heavy baggage for them. And so one can easily see COVID-19 adding to that sort of pressure. As far as the security services are concerned, this has become a family firm. Uh, the three sons of uh, President Sisi, two of them are still in, in key roles and the former head of his office is now basically the chief of uh, the combined intelligence services. So this is a very narrow base upon which to run uh, a, a, a far flung uh, security and intelligence service. Uh, so what I just end by saying is that uh, COVID-19 has infected a dictatorship that already has pre-existing conditions uh, and that the chance that uh, this could be a, a fatal in infestation uh, is, uh, is reasonably serious. Thank you very much, Bob. Emma. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, when uh, when it comes to the Gulf countries, I I see three main uh, future challenges for the armed forces and the civil military relations um, in relations to uh, the pandemic. the The first is that the pandemic and the steep drop in oil prices created created an economic stress uh, that could lead to major cuts in military spending uh, and or arms procurement. The second is that uh, the military outreach uh, that we see today and an emphasis on building an indigenous arms industry as a means of economic diversification could come to a stop or at least be deeply reshaped in the countries that decided to do that. And the third is that it could accelerate a redefinition of national security and the role of the armed forces in uh, protecting it. So on my first point about a possible decrease in uh, military spending and or arms procurement, I think it's important to remember that one does not uh, in directly translate into the other. Um, if you look at databases such as uh, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute uh, database on defense spending, there's a note on Gulf countries and specifically on the UAE reminding everyone that uh, when the, the military spending that are listed uh, and tracked every year uh, 
do not necessarily, uh, usually do not include uh, arms procurement, uh, um, arms purchases. Uh, what what that means is that you could see a reduc reduction of military spending, which covers uh, um, the 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 um, paying for infrastructure, but mostly for the salaries of the armed forces, uh, without having a drop in armed purchases, or the other way around. Uh, and those two are connected to very different traditional dynamics in uh, the security and stability of the Gulf countries. The military spending are connected to the traditional entire state uh, social contract. So if you touch the, the military spending, that, that is bound to have consequences on the, the social contract between the government and uh, the citizens. Whereas if you touch to the arm purchases, then that is directly connected to outside security assistance since uh, arms trade in the Gulf, uh, as we know, is still very, uh, very much a, a tool of, um, of buying life insur insurance, if you will, uh, according to quid pro quo dynamic, whereby if uh, you buy weapons from uh, mostly the United States, then uh, that buys uh, a security blanket from the United States and to a lesser extent, European countries such as the United Kingdom and France. On my second point, uh, and what I wanted to add on this point is that you, you will probably see differences uh, between the countries as to how they react um, because their arm purchases today do not necessarily um, respond uh, to the same needs. Uh, if you look at Qatar, for instance, especially since the beginning of uh, the diplomatist pact with its neighbors, you have seen a spike in uh, arms purchases uh, that definitely serve as life insurance. Uh, to protect itself against possible attacks from neighbors, whereas Saudi Arabia and the UAE today um, buy weapons to actually use them in, uh, in projection of armed forces on outside, uh, in, in outside countries and that serves their military outreach, which brings me to my second point. The military outreach uh, in the context of the pandemic has uh, well, the pandemic has added uh, negative international attention to the intervention of Saudi Arabia and the UAE in Yemen. It has also uh, added negative attention to the role of the UAE amidst many other outside powers in the Libyan chaos uh, through its military support to Haftar. More generally, it's important to note that the United Nations Secretary General called for a global ceasefire uh, amidst the pandemic, and the, you have had uh, numerous calls to divert resources from the defense sector towards the public health sector um, today. So what that means for the Gulf countries is that it, it is possible that it will lead to a downsize of, of their military outreach on the longer term uh, and or put an end to the idea of developing a defense industrial base uh, as part of their vision 2030, especially for Saudi Arabia, since the defense industry now is still very nascent and um, uh, which is not the case in, in the UAE. In the UAE, the, the defense industry is a little bit more developed than in Saudi Arabia. So what you could see there is uh, a, a part, uh, partly reorganization of this defense industry. We've seen one example lately of uh, a company, Strata, uh, starting to manufacture N N95 masks. So that might be a sign of a, of a longer reorganization to come, although uh, we should not see too much in, in this, obviously. And the third, uh, the third point is about the, the redefinition of uh, national uh, security in, in the Gulf and in other uh, in other countries, the pandemic uh, has forced a, an increased focus on, on health, obviously, but also food security and home in, uh, other human-based uh, security aspects, um, which does not necessarily mean that there would be a diversion from defense budget per se to other budgets. What, it is, what is interesting is that it could become 
a, an inherent part of national national security strategies. Uh, you have uh, other countries around the world, such as Germany, for instance, pointing to how how much um, providing overseas uh, de development aid to other countries is inherently part of national security because in the end it prevents outbreaks of violence, civil wars, and eventually uh, migration fluxes. Um, so two ways in which I see uh, that could have an impact on uh, the, the way armed forces um, play a role in national security is that they could be, uh, they could be in, in they could be, um, they could be part of those efforts uh, of development aid abroad, such as we've seen with the UAE lately. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, uh, I think this pandemic is accelerating a possible industrial revolution with new technologies such as artificial intelligence that could participate in the next, next phase of the modernization of these armed forces. Thank you very much, Emma. Yeah, Aram, over to you. Thanks, Nathan, and thanks to the, uh, the whole panel. Uh, just a quick sit rep, and then we'll move forward on the four mix of core challenges in the context of Lebanon. Uh, as things stand now, you have a caseload of about 1,200 active case, 1,200 cases reported since February, 500 active cases, uh, and you have a low persistent caseload tied to COVID-19, which is ebbed on by repatriation flights, and in historical terms, affected by things like poor reporting or low reporting of cases and some serious gaps in testing. Now, in terms of the, the LAF response, uh, the first core step taken by the military to address this was establishing a, a COVID-19 rapid response committee. Uh, it did so uh, relatively quickly uh, in, the, in, in the context of a government order for general mobilization, wherein the military was largely not consulted in the initial phase of the, of the rollout. Uh, unlike what many would have assumed of the LAF, it's not a committee of senior generals. This is a committee of uh, mid-level line officers. We're talking majors to lieutenant colonels, if not a full colonel. And this brings together uh, four officers from the personnel branch, J1, the operations branch, J3, the DMI, the military intelligence branch, and the medical services branch to report directly up to the chief of defense, the commander of the LAF, through, a, through an intermediary at the command level, and then, or, and then work vertically within their different branches of the military to coordinate requirements tied to mitigating COVID-19, um, channeling acquisition efforts tied to personal protection equipment and so on. You know, we're talking about a mobilization of 40,000 troops to deal with COVID-19. That's 50% of LAF total manpower. And, SOPs, standard operating procedures, were adapted quickly to mitigate the potential should you have a squad or a platoon that comes in contact with a potentially infected group or a group of civilians that might not be infected but are in close proximity to military personnel. And that has worked relatively well. Uh, you've had a fairly low caseload. Uh, in most cases, we're talking single digit uh, when, you, when you factor in things like you know, retired personnel who are on active duty, their families, and so on. Uh, and much like in the case of Tunisia that Fred described, you do have in the case of Lebanon a bright spot in the sense that you have a military that in many ways was more proactive uh, and more risk averse than some of the public officials who were trying to think of an appropriate response. Uh, very quickly, the military tried to situate itself on what its burn rate was when it came to PPEs, uh, how and where it could acquire them, and even standing up local production capacity. Now, that's all good and well in the now. Uh, in the longer term, you have four baskets of challenges. Uh, the first group is tied to uh, the pandemic, but the rest are not. They're pre-existing mixes of challenges. So the LAF ultimately is, is operating under the assumption that a second wave of the pandemic is inevitable, that the mix of mitigating actions in Lebanon are all positive, but the global trends indicate a need to hunker down for a larger second wave. This means things like coordinating with partners and donors, 
and with local businesses to do things like build up local stockpiles of PPE and other equipment, uh, to do things that have taken place in Tunisia, but have, haven't, there hasn't been a need yet in Lebanon, things like field hospitals and added capacity for ICU beds. These are all things that the LAF hopes they won't need, but there's a recognition that there's a need to be ready. The other piece in this is, you know, LAF standard operating procedures themselves. Uh, those SOPs uh, tight in the initial phase of the, of the pandemic have come slightly lax uh, in the last month or so. You, you have a recognition within, within LAF leadership that there's a need not just to reinforce social distancing within the military, but to reinforce a, a, a frame of reference tied to physical distancing. That, that affects everything from how squads interact with civilians all the way to how you do logistics to getting military personnel from point A to point B, how you use the motor pool, things that really, you know, most, most modern militaries have seen as a 50th ancillary, you know, element in an annex of a planning document have now become critical elements to making sure you have a fighting force that is fit for purpose and that isn't dealing with its own internal uh, medical crisis. The other challenges really have are pre-existing challenges that Lebanon and the LAF have been dealing with writ large. The first is the mix of existing international commitments and obligations. And it's important to point out that in meeting with those obligations, that things like uh, sustaining, reinforcing, and expanding the, uh, the rapid land border project uh, along the frontier with Syria, consolidating that further, and tying that into the, the global structure, the national structure on territorial defense. Uh, things like uh, supporting and sustaining LAF obligations tied to the UNIFIL area of responsibility, tied to the blue line with Israel, uh, and standing up additional capacity in the maritime domain as the multinational task force draws down and international partners reallocate resources in the maritime domain, forcing the Lebanese to stand in. These are all things that require the military to be laser focused on national security issues. But it's important in the context of COVID-19 and in the context of, of being asked time and again uh, to engage in public order missions, including uh, pre-existing missions in the wake of uh, popular unrest and protests tied to corruption, the mismanagement of the economy in October onwards, these are all corrosive uh, when it comes to how the military A, sees itself as a national security institution. It's a poison chalice in terms of uh, reorienting the military away from national defense and back to where most of the political elites of the country prefer, which is constabulary actions and internal stability operations. And it undermines public confidence. Uh, the more the military comes into contact with the public at large, and the more there's a chance for uh, contact, conflict, escalation, the more that has a negative impact on, on morale within the military and public opinion writ large. And all of these things do, do lasting damage if they're not mitigated when it comes to laugh military professionalization. The second, the, the, the third basket is fiscal and budgetary. Uh, the economic crisis and currency devaluation in, in Lebanon have basically wiped out 60% of real world purchasing power of anyone serving in the armed forces. Uh, that means that you have difficult choices that especially junior and mid-level personnel have to make when it comes to how they allocate scarcer and scarcer resources. And this is against a backdrop that most Lebanese are not aware of tied to entitlements. If this were 2018, a military officer in the LAF would say, you know, would have access to 85% coverage on education entitlements for children, including international education. In 2019, they went down to 45%, and they were mitigating effects on international education. And now in 2020, it's basically 5 million Lebanese pounds in most cases per child. So we're talking about a massive draw, uh, clawback, as it were, on key entitlements that military personnel used to lean on uh, relative to the fact that their wages were not annually adjusted for inflation. These are the kinds of things 
that will basically force young officers, NCOs, uh, and especially the enlisted, to have to think long and hard about, do I pay for that service to go down to barracks to serve, or do I stay home? And unfortunately, this is not the first time this has happened. Between 86 and 1990, you had a similar pattern where the military had enormous budget constraints and had to make a triage decision uh, tied to how to finance and how to budget uh, for unit cohesion. And the, and the effect was you prioritize unit and military cohesion at the expense of executing the mission. Paradoxically, this both incre increases on the one hand, the risk that LAF personnel who already are increasingly sympathetic and have always been sympathetic at the junior to mid-level, uh, sympathetic with public discontent and protests, they could, there, is, there is a risk that those sentiments could become far more tangible. But on the other hand, you also have uh, a dangerous opportunity uh, whereby you have an LAF that's exposed to Lebanon's clientelist practices. Uh, so this is a dual challenge. And lastly, you have the basket of changing domestic and strategic constraints. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about uh, partners and, and, and military, military aid and what that does to sustain some of these forces that we're discussing. In the case of the LAF, it is living in a regional environment where its critical partner, the US system, represented by CENTCOM and SOCSENT special forces personnel, has dramatically curtailed and drawn down its partner engagement activities within the larger CENTCOM area of responsibility. That includes Lebanon, it includes Jordan, it includes Egypt. This is, a, this is a major disruption of business as usual when it comes to training engagements with key partners. And it deteriorates the kinds of core relationships that militaries like the LAF rely on when it comes to how they manage their long-term relationships. And more critically, uh, as countries around the world, including the United States, seek to prioritize and reorganize their budgets uh, in, in the wake of the economic devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic, you have very real questions about the sustainability of any partner nation when it comes to aid levels in 2019, 2020, and going forward. And it's important to remember that in the case of Lebanon, the powers that be in, in, the, in the political domain have basically rendered the, the Lebanese defense budget a current, a current account budget where it's limited to personal expenditures and entitlements, which have already been called back significantly and with little, very little skin in the game when it comes to the acquisition uh, side of the game. You don't have a procurement budget. And paradoxically, you have a military in 2020 that is at the tail end of its acquisition cycle and needs on the order of $175 million a year to keep new capabilities that it's acquired operational and in service. So we are very much in the sustainment phase when it comes to Lebanon and its military capabilities. All of this is overshadowed by the, the, the very tangible threat that most Lebanese have to think about tied to the next cycle or a hypothetical cycle of Israeli Hezbollah conflict. One which are arguably would be far more devastating than any, any conflict in 2006 or, or, or before. And on an, order, on an order of magnitude that most Lebanese themselves have a hard time understanding. And the military has to think about its own place within that environment and how, what the circumstances of any future conflict might, might be when it comes to the orientation and the posture of the LAF and national defense. And the last point I wanna make in closing uh, is that you have a Lebanon now that is slowly sliding back into its cycle of popular protest and discontent. Uh, and the military has struggled with, on the one hand, executing orders given by civilian leadership, uh, and at the same time, trying to abide and solidify the popular support that it has been uh, gracious enough to have uh, for the last 30 years. A level of support that can erode if the military isn't careful in how it calibrates its response. Uh, I've said this to my military colleagues before, and I continue to say it. There is always, uh, there's always time to reassess the, the moral role of the military when it comes to public order missions and national security defense. And there's every reason to expect the military to have to heed those kinds of warnings again, as it weighs the costs of its actions tied to public protests in June and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aram.
I appreciate the panelists' remarks. And uh, the way I'd like to handle questions is uh, I'll, I'll give two general questions and I'll, I'll let you, the panelists, uh, address them. And then after we finish that round of two questions, I have, there are a, a couple of specific questions for individual panelists. So the first general question is um, that the, the pandemic has isolated Middle Eastern countries from one another. And, and so the, the question is, what effect um, will this have on economic and military cooperation? What, what will that look like in the future in the countries in the Middle East? And then uh, also the military reputation of um, the reputation of the Jordanian military, for instance, has been enhanced by its response to the, the pandemic. And so wondering in the countries that you are looking at, what has, how has the military's reputation changed, if at all? Uh, so start with the first question and then uh, anybody can start and then we'll uh, go to the second one after you've, you've done. <clears throat> Thank go ahead, Fred. Uh, you're, you're muted. The military and economic, um, you know, cooperation. Obviously, Tunisia is a, a sort of a central part of Maghreb security cooperation, especially for the United States. I mean, the U.S. would like to sort of position Tunisia to be a hub for various training activities. Um, obviously, that's not happening now. There were there were Maghreb and Sahel ex ex exercises that were canceled. Um, you know, the broader issue, and just to echo Aram, is, you know, security cooperation on, on the U.S. side is really going to dial back, both because of the pandemic constraints on travel, but also the U.S. Um, AFRICOM is, is dialing back as well. And so the Tunisians need to manage their expectations for what, um, you know, what the U.S. is going to provide. Um, you know, I had some uh, Department of Defense uh, officials tell me about, you know, how they're doing security assistance now. And there are certain things you cannot do on Zoom with the Tunisian, you know, with any military. You need face-to-face, -face, you know, cooperation, mentorship, sustained personal contact. Um, there's a plan apparently um, by DOD to embed advisors within the Tunisian military of defense sort of mentorship role. And obviously that's not happening now. And we don't know when that's gonna happen. And similarly, um, you know, there's an entire, we don't know how long the the halt on uh, Tunisian military students coming to the US for military schools is gonna continue. There's important socialization aspects there. So these are all, you know, ripple effects that I think could, could be felt um, over the long term. About Egypt, uh, uh, Nathan, I think the implication of your question is that uh, it's likely that there will be obstacles placed uh, in the way of further integration cooperation between Arab uh, militaries. I think this is very much the case in Egypt. Uh, that cooperation has essentially been limited to, uh, if you will, sort of gray zone conflicts participation with the Emiratis uh, in Libya being the case in point. Uh, and Emma can probably explain more to us about what the nature uh, of Emirati support and involvement with the Egyptians will be in that and potentially other theaters. But the Egyptians have always been wary about this and the Emiratis and the Saudis uh, have themselves uh, been somewhat disappointed with the amount of support uh, provided by the Egyptian military. My guess is that the COVID-19 pandemic is going to exacerbate those underlying tensions. The good news is uh, that it could overall have the effect of reducing proxy activities, that these constraints uh, in Libya and elsewhere uh, might in fact uh, sort of lead to a, a somewhat uh, reduced role for external forces, including that of Egypt. Uh, so possibly it's good news that that cooperation, which in many cases has been of a, uh, engagement in proxy wars uh, will be reduced. Um, as far as the Egyptian military's reputation in handling COVID-19 is concerned, uh, the chief person appointed by President Sisi to handle at least the public relations part of the pandemic is a civilian. Uh, and 
possibly this was done because at the very outset of uh, the infection in Egypt, uh, it was uh, uh, military officers who were the sort of uh, uh, most noted uh, victims of it. And so the military sort of stepped back in a way. There was some criticism also of military hospitals of not allowing civilians access for treatment of COVID-19. And possibly as a result uh, of this, the, the civilians were given a rather greater role than is typically the case uh, in delivery of, in recently in under Sisi. Uh, civilians played a more prominent role than they have in the past. And they could have been a calculation of shielding the military from negative feedback from this, which had already begun in the very early days going back to March. So uh, in, in effect, um, the military is sort of hidden behind the skirts, if you will, of uh, the civilian hospital system, uh, of the spokesperson for the presidency and so on. So uh, the military has played a behind the scenes role and in effect, not a terrible <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you uh, for these questions. When it comes to the, the Gulf in terms of um, economics and military cooperation, um, I think there's, there, there is still a lot of potential for in, intra-Gulf uh, economic and military cooperation, provided that they uh, could solve the diplomatic spat that remains a huge ob obstacle to such cooperation. Um, actually, this pandemic has, has given um, has given the GCC countries opportunity to, uh, to meet around uh, health issues and finance uh, com commonalities. So that could have been, um, that, that could be a sign that they, they could move towards a resolution of this uh, crisis that could have then um, positive implications in, in terms of moving forward uh, with economic and military cooperation. And um, Actually, what I wanted to point out is that, as uh, has been underlined in uh, by by a lot of observers of the region, this uh, pandemic has also given way to warmer relations, including between uh, the UAE and Iran, for instance, in terms of how uh, how they provided humanitarian assistance, and so this. This could be seen as a sign that if they uh, really focus on what their common interests and common threats, uh, including in both side, uh, on both sides of the Gulf are, um, that they can move towards more cooperation. Uh, and the way to do that would be to move forward with an incremental approach, uh, taking, uh, taking baby steps, if you will, uh, in, in finding areas of, of common interest, uh, such as maritime security, where they could build on that then. Uh, and when it comes to the reputation of the armed forces in the Gulf countries, they were, they were already uh, good. It's, it's interesting to note that, um, that although there have been some critics inside, for instance, Saudi Arabia, uh, when it comes to the investments abroad in, uh, you know, high profile investment in football clubs or um, high profile investments like this. The military spending, for instance, has not been criticized by uh, the citizens and uh, they are not um, the yeah, the reputation was was good. And I think in country in a country like the UAE. It has uh, been in increasingly uh, good amidst the citizen in the way that the UAE handled the, uh, the, the reaction to the pandemic through a civil military plan, including uh, civilians in, uh, in the response. And, uh, and we can see that Mohammed bin Zayed really, uh, really focuses the, the future of, of his country uh, still on a, a high prioritization of the defense uh, defense apparel and armed forces. Look, uh, more than regional cooperation, the, the disruption of how the Lebanese and the Lebanese military interact with their partners on budgets is critical. Normally, May is markup season here in the US, and this is when you engage 
or preferably earlier in April uh, with uh, congressional leaders directly and indirectly uh, on future spending tied to programs like foreign military funding, FMF, and some of the DOD vehicles to support the LAF. A lot of that has been, I won't say undermined, uh, but set back. They've had to, they've had, they've had to been mitigating actions and in some cases using virtual tools to get, to get the same message across. But in the more tangible sense, uh, there are aspects of the, the U.S. structure in the CENTCOM area of responsibility that have found innovative ways to continue business as usual. You know, SOC CENT uh, and you know, Task Force 5 and other structures have been actively involved uh, when it comes to, th to thinking through how best to help when it comes to things like the COVID-19 crisis and also how best to help when it comes to the food and security crisis that's emerging as a consequence of the nexus of the COVID-19 pandemic and Lebanon's economic instability. Now, beyond that, there is, you know, there is a, a very real set of relationships that the LAF has fostered with regional partners, Jordan in particular. Uh, the, the JAF and the LAF have worked closely uh, since the mid 2000s to share expertise. They both have uh, shared, shared experiences tied to border management in the case of Lebanon with Syria, uh, and also in the case of Jordan with Syria, but also Iraq. Uh, and there and there's ongoing there's an ongoing partnership there. All of this will have to be recalibrated. I don't think it's ever a question that you will see a long-term contraction uh, in cooperation. It's just going to have to adapt to the, the mitigating effects of the COVID-19 crisis, not much more than that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so there definitely be effects on uh you know, cooperation and there have been, uh, I mean, some impact on on uh, reputation, but I'm not hearing that there's been a, a great deal, right? Uh, actually, it seems like pre-existing um, attitudes seem to, to prevail when it comes to the reputation of the military. So I have um, uh, two questions, uh, one for Fred and one for Bob. And then um, I'll let them answer. And then we'll have two final questions, one for Emma and one for Aram. Uh, so Fred, the question for you is, will this financial pressure that you talk about in Tunisia, will it lead to uh, more formalized procurement like it has in Lebanon or like it did before COVID? <laughs> um, and what will be the impact of Western partners on transparency of this procurement? And then Bob, for you, um, uh, the question is, how do recent personnel changes in the Egyptian armed forces in recent years, um, it, how would they affect the possibility of the military acting against Sisi? So for instance, uh, changes in the uh, Minister of Defense, the Chief of Staff, and the uh, Head of General Intelligence. Uh, so Fred and Bob will give you uh, a, a minute or two, a minute each. To answer the questions. Well, I think this certainly provides a window and an impetus. Um, I mean, much of Tunisia's defense planning defaults to the bilateral cooperation document that it has with the U.S., um, the BCAP, Bilateral Cooperation Action Plan, because it doesn't have a white paper. It doesn't have any planning document. There's been efforts to do that, but there was never any home for that. There's there's no joint staff in Tunisia. There's no J5. There's been no real ownership. Of course, various U.S. entities have tried to fix that. But no, I, I think this the next couple months, the next year are a window for you know wise Tunisian leadership to say, look, this is this is a crucial period where we need to have a more rationalized. Um, process for triaging for procurement um, and so I think the U.S. obviously can help the U.S. has a capability to do that called the institutional capacity building initiative which is I think prepared to help but again there's pandemic related you know constraints there so um, no my hope is is that the Tunisians will you know uh, I think step up to this but there are enormous you know, bureaucratic um, and cultural constraints. I mean, the, the Tunisians typically have shielded their budget processes from outside scrutiny um, to include the French. So there's embedded, you know, cultural issues there. And, and that goes for, for transparency with the parliamentary committees um, as well. 
Uh, Nathan, I think we're running short on time, so I shall be as concise as I possibly can about the implications of personnel changes in military and security. Under CC, uh, what he's basically done is to clean out uh, of both military and security anyone who was sort of, who was in this category, let's say, of crime or inter terrorists, where they were former colleagues of his, where they were officers who indeed were senior to him, who were older. <clears throat> and uh, so like any dictator consolidating power, uh, he definitely did not want to have anyone who was of equal or indeed even superior stature to himself, certainly in the minds of fellow officers. And so I think what we've seen, uh, since 2014 and, and at inter intermittent times uh, over that period where there's been little waves of purges is that all of this is intended to bring in younger officers who are tied directly to him or to his son in key positions and thereby consolidate his personal control. And as I alluded to in my opening comments, the narrower the base of control is and it's centered down really on his family uh, the risker you know, the whole operation is. Yes, he doesn't have challengers from Sixty Sophie or other individuals, uh, but at the same time, uh, the alienation factor uh, as a result of officers who did have support within the military being removed is bound to uh, 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 operate against him when and if the pressure mounts as it did, for example, back in 2011. Thank you, Bob and Ben. So for uh, Aram and Emma. So Aram, the, the question that we received in the chat was uh, regarding the LAF's communication strategy, how, how does the LAF uh, continue to build popular support uh, based on its existing communication strategy? Could you assess that communica communication strategy and, and talk about what that would mean going forward for popular support? And then, uh, Emma, this redefinition of national security that you talk about in the Gulf countries, what implications does it have for migrant workers, um, if any? And, and what would that mean for the uh, underlying economic situation, the, the, the social arrangement that uh, exists in Gulf countries? So, Aram, over to you and then Emma. Look, uh, strategic communications uh, in the lab is arguably one of the capabilities that is, 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 is the last to join the toolkit. Uh, arguably, I'd say that, you know, we tend to think of military reform and post-2005, post-Syria military reform as sort of a panacea that it just, you can create capability quickly, you can stand up a new ethos quickly, you can, you can, you can quickly reorient and re-energize the military. And in some areas of military development, you can do that, but in most of the areas that are critical, it's a, it's a culture shift and, and, and the corporate identity has to accommodate those changes. The two places that have always taken the longest to adapt to that are military intelligence and communications orientation. Um, in the case of the orientation directorate, which is responsible for engaging with the public at large, uh, the closest thing that the Lebanese military has had in terms of doing active, proactive strategic communications was in 2017 in the Dawn of the Hills campaign against ISIL. And in that case, the orientation directorate was superseded uh, by an executive structure on top of it to actively deal with disinformation, frankly, disinformation from Hezbollah and Hezbollah allies. They tried to create far more proximity uh, with military forces than actually existed on the ground. Today, it's more complex because you don't have that combat theater environment, nor should you. You're dealing with, you're, you're dealing with fellow citizens and you have a public order mission that is degrading in terms of its effect, its, its optics. And in many cases, we're back to square one where you don't have a modern 21st century uh, strategic communication strategy. There is no there is no large scale STRATCOM implementation at this time. There is a, there is a limited focus capability. Uh, there has been an effort for some time now to expand that and frankly, to modernize the, the best practices of the orientation director in the military. And 
it can't come soon enough because most of the most of the communications faux pas of the military the mistakes are unforced errors uh, poor poor in some, in some cases just frankly poor judgment in terms of how one narrative will and will not affect the public that is looking for military leadership more than anything else uh, so you how do you do that well you 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 do some of the things that happened in 2017 you expand executive privilege within the laugh above the level of the orientation director. You take the reins of the message. Uh, it's always been my view throughout this is economic crisis and then the pandemic that the military, you know, has, has been caught in, 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 a, in a prism of its own making in the sense that on the one hand, it really wants to abide civilian authority. It doesn't, it doesn't want to set a precedent where it is messaging in a domain and space where government should be, should be messaging. But in a space where the military is, is basically alone and there isn't a coherent message to, to show unity, to, to, to create, uh, to, to bridge these divides and to show intent, okay, these are areas where the military has, has in some cases crossed that line to, to signal its intent. Two or three times it did so during the initial protests. It has to do so again now when protests resume. Thank you, Adam. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, really quickly, and minus two minutes, I would like to say that, um, yeah, the impact on uh, labor migrant um, uh, of the redefinition of national security uh, is a multifaceted uh, implication. I think one, one aspect of it is, and we've seen that actually uh, in relation to the redefinition of the um, rent higher social contract, you've seen Kuwait, for instance, Oman pointing to uh, their will of reducting expat population, uh, which is connected to national security uh, concern, not, not in the sense that I, that I uh, explained earlier, but in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of redefining the, the, the relations between, uh, between the government and, and the population. Um, so that, that is bound to have an impact in, in the sense that you will have less, uh, less expat, uh, expat work, uh, a lesser expat population. But then what I would say is that this pandemic uh, has also added uh, um, international negative international attention to uh, the the um, status of uh, migrant uh, labor migrant in in some of the GCC countries and the post pandemic Gulf might look very different for for them uh, in the sense that it has become it has become clear that they are extremely important to the economy of uh, these countries and that the government might have to implement measures to, uh, to, have, uh, to improve their status. That is one thing. But then in terms of the redefinition of national security, moving possibly from one type of industry or private, private sector to another, what is interesting is that the, the labor migrant are um, well, most of the uh, skilled uh, engineers in, in private companies in the Gulf are from outside of the Gulf countries. So what that would mean is that essentially they would move from one, one type of sector to another as engineers. But in that sense, that would not change a lot. All right. Thank you very much, Emma. I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for, their, for your insights. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to see in, in response to the questions we started the panel with, you know, there's something of a bright spot for, for Tunisia and, and Lebanon. Uh, you know, in, in Egypt, we have sort of this, uh, uh, this high wire act, I guess is what <laughs> the analogy that Bob used. And then uh, there are changes coming in, in the Gulf as well. Uh, this is, these are complex issues and we've, we've discussed just uh, four different areas in a, a, a very, very large region, a very large, diverse region. Um, so I hope we won't lose sight of the, the longer term as we deal with the, the short term uh, pandemic crisis, that there are issues with how the military interacts with society, with civilian authorities uh, in the Arab world, 
um, that people around the world from, from Western partners, Western uh, uh, donors and supporters to even actors in the region uh, that they should be aware of. And uh, so thank you again and um, look forward to the, the next time we get to chat. Goodbye.